Thank you for coming. Welcome to the uh, National Weather Center. Fantastic facility. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, uh, this is a great place to be this time of the year because you will be the first to know if there's any storms, tornadoes, anything else. And this place is built like a fortress, so uh, we're, in, we're in good shape. Welcome to the fourth annual Energy, uh, Energy Symposium that's sponsored by the uh, Energy Institute of the Price College of Business at OU. Uh, I know many of you in here, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jay Jimerson. I am the uh, chairman of the advisory board for the Energy Institute. What that means is I'm going to be the one that's going to try to keep us on schedule today um, and keep this thing moving. A few housekeeping items. First of all, a major announcement for those of you that don't know, our men's basketball team is in the Final Four this weekend. That's a monumental accomplishment for a school that's known for its football teams, of course. Um, so congratulations to Coach Kruger and the rest of the guys, Buddy Heald. I want to say a special thanks to whoever taught Buddy Heald how to shoot a basketball. And may his consistency in shooting continue for at least two more games. Um, and then may the Thunder pick him up uh, here this spring. So we'll see. Um, if, if you got cell phone with you, if you don't mind putting it on silent, that would be great. Let me go over the schedule a little bit and give you the preview. Um, I think, is Dean Pullen here? Oh, good. All right. Good. Um, I'll introduce Dean Pullen in a minute. Uh, before we do that, though, um, let me give you a little preview of, of the schedule for today and where we'll be going, what we'll be doing. First of all, um, we will at about 9 after Dean Pullen starts, start with the first panel. Um, this year's program features 11 really highly recognized speakers. They're outstanding, and we were very pleased to have them here. I think you are in for a real a real treat and they're going to they'll engage in a pretty wide-ranging discussion of a bunch of different topics that are centered around our theme this year America's future the role of energy and policy in achieving visionary objectives um, the first panel uh, will give us a little bit of a preview or backdrop um, that will tie into that theme they'll be talking about geopolitical economic issues as they relate to energy. So they'll be talking about things like what's happening in the Middle East right now, what's its impact on energy, what about Russia, uh, what's Putin's agenda, uh, particularly when it comes to energy, what about China, um, do, is China going to be growing or not? Um, that has a major impact on energy, of course. And then what will the energy forecast be, not only for the U.S., but around the world? They'll be talking about some of those things. We'll then take a 15-minute break, and that will be at 1045, I'm sorry, at 1030. Uh, 1045 will reconvene for the second panel. By the way, M uh, Mike Stice, and I'll introduce him a little bit, he'll be the moderator for the first panel. Bruce Stover will be the moderator for the second panel that will start at 1045 after the 15 minute break. Uh, they'll follow up uh, the first panel and talk about uh, energy strategy and policy issues, and they'll talk about, that'll include the role of power, natural gas, coal, uh, and renewables in the U.S. energy strategy. Uh, they'll also be discussing, I, I believe they'll get into some environmental issues um, and matters, as well as the role that technology can play uh, in developing our energy policy. Um, if they have time, I think they'll also probably touch on LNG and um, oil exports, too. That's becoming a pretty uh, hot topic these days. Um, but before I introduce uh, Dean Pullen, let me let me say thanks and introduce a few people. First of all, Dr. Ghosh, Dr. DePanker Ghosh. There he is. Um, Dr. Ghosh is the David Ross Boyd and David Steed Professor of Accounting at OU. But just as importantly, uh, he is the founder and executive director of the Energy Institute at OU. And I can tell you that he works about 35 hours a day between working at OU and then working and supporting the Energy Institute. So uh, certainly thanks to you for everything you do. He burns it at both ends, I can tell you that. Um, Adam Clinton and Taylor Heatley, uh, I don't know if they're in here, but they both work at OU. They've been working on this now for four years or so, and they help make this all work logistically. And so thanks to them, uh, Christina Donovan, who see back up in there uh, is my assistant. She helped with all, a lot of the logistics on this. So thanks to, uh, to all of you. Um, OU is very fortunate to have Daniel Pullen as the dean of the uh, Price College of Business. Um, I've gotten to know him uh, well over the last several years. And I can tell you, he understands energy. And he understands the importance of energy to all of us, including the importance of energy education and excellence in energy education. 
Um, as a result, he's, he's been a huge supporter of the Ener Energy um, Institute and its endeavors, uh, research, uh, outreach, and education. I can tell you that he bleeds crimson and cream. Um, he earned his undergraduate degree in, uh, degrees in accounting and finance from OU, an MBA uh, from Harvard, uh, and then his law degree or Juris Doctorate from the OU Law School. So we're very fortunate to have him here with us today, too, and I'll introduce you to Dean Bolton. Well, thank you, thank you, Jay. Um, I think it's clear that uh, when you have a leader chairing the board of such an important institute like the Energy Institute here at the University of Oklahoma, um, we're just so blessed to have uh, the great leadership of, of Jay, who followed Bruce Stover, who's here with us today as well. I mean, it's just been a, a really an amazing ride over really just the last uh, four or five years since we were able to stand up this institute and to have a crowd like we have here today for a really important dialogue that our state and nation needs to the point where I think we had to call the fire marshal earlier to make sure that we could squeeze everybody in. Um, it's really been a record level of attendance and I think it just speaks to the importance of our work that collectively we get to attack today. Um, you know, I think that universities play such an important role, perhaps a, perhaps a unique role in being able to assemble such a collection of talent, being student talent, faculty talent, staff, alumni, thought leaders from all over the world like those behind me and others in the crowd. And very few institutions can really pull that type of brain trust, those intergenerational thought leaders together the way a university can. And I know of no other university but the University of Oklahoma can do that in a forward way around a topic of such importance like the future of energy. Um, there's a lot of things that make me excited about today's event, uh, but perhaps foremost is that it's just right in the crosshairs of our strategic direction as a college of business and as a university, broadly speaking. I think this is borne out um, through our recent decision uh, to adopt a purpose statement for the Price College of Business, something, and as we're the Price College, we colloquially call it the purpose of price. And it's simple. The statement is bold. It's also quite direct. And it's just one sentence. The purpose of price is to ensure the enduring global competitiveness of Oklahoma and the nation. Period. Everything we do, every faculty we recruit, every student we admit, every class we teach, every conversation we facilitate, like the discourse that's going to occur here today, everything we do has to in some way make this great state and this amazing country stronger in a lasting way at global scale. And if it doesn't, we shouldn't be doing it. It's off message, it's off focus. We don't have the financial profile, public funding for higher education in this country and, and let alone the state. We don't have the fiscal luxury of, of duplicating things. We don't have the fiscal luxury of, of investing in any just good idea that comes along. We have to pick and bucket and prioritize and really tackle the issues that matter the most. And so in many ways, it's quite liberating. Right? We can have a very plain conversation with our alums, with our faculty, with our students, and say, what are the handful of things that are going to mean the most to the Sooner State? What are the handful of things that are really going to ensure our nation's competitiveness as we look out in the decades to follow? And so as OU's second largest college and largest professional school, we believe the Price College of Business has to serve as an economic engine for Oklahoma. We have to work hard every day to generate valuable insights into the most pressing business issues of our time and then translate those insights to our students, the true instruments of our impact as they are prepared to absorb, deploy, and improve upon those insights in practice. It's where our students go through the momentum of conversations like today. So it's that when they graduate, they're able to add value day one to the world's 
and Oklahoma's and this country's great employers, many of which are in the energy industry, because they're really going to be the lasting vestiges of the investment we make. Now, it's no surprise that given, well, candidly and crassly, the financial heft of the energy industry, the geopolitical importance of energy stability for our nation, and then just the historic tie of this sector to, to this interstate. It should be no surprise that on those big issues that we tackle, those priorities that we bucket, that energy rises to the top of the list. And if you play that out even further and you recognize this industry's workforce gap in recent decades, and you think about how this industry has been transformed through technological revolution, whether it's horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, other advancements, right? the types of technologies, the types of leaders and workforce participants that are developed at a, at a university, there really should be no stronger relationship than that between the energy industry and higher education. At OU, as you think about our university, it's just a natural. Energy is, in many ways, our birthright. In fact, we've been doing it for over 100 years. The linkage between this industry, the linkage between the university and the way we set our priorities is, is profound. And candidly, the, the results, they speak for themselves. The Mewburn College of Earth and Energy regularly delivers a top five, I believe it's a top one, petroleum engineering program. It was the nation's first, and this program has graduated more petroleum engineers than any other in the world. The Gallagher College of Engineering's Natural Gas Engineering and Management Program, it's a phenomenal program. It's the only one of its kind in the entire world that offers a systems level view of the entire value chain of natural gas. The College of Laws, John B. Turner LLM program, it attracts students worldwide to specialize in energy, natural resources law, policy, and sustainability. Several of our sister colleges are here today. I can assure you this type of conversation, this type of talent, these amazing students could not be assembled if this University of Oklahoma didn't work together in a way that sets the standard across the nation. We have multiple deans from multiple colleges, other leaders, faculty from across the university, students from across the university, taking a step forward, showing this investment in this all-important focus area for the university. And of course, at Price College, I think it would be an understatement, but I'll just do the best I can just to say that we are all in on energy. We boast the nation's most comprehensive, whether it's from a breadth perspective or a depth of impact perspective, the most comprehensive collection of business energy programs. Currently, we have five different programs, and I can tell you that number is and counting. Five different programs at all educational levels, starting with our undergraduates, all the way to the master's levels, the way we're preparing our PhD students to lead in this field from an intellectual perspective, from the way we teach this field in the future, to executive education, many of which um, uh, uh, alumni from those programs are in the, in the audience today. At the undergraduate level, we offer the Robert M. Zinke Energy Management Program. So many of you in this room are alums. So many of our students are from that program here today. It was the first, it is the largest, it is the most distinctive of its kind anywhere in the world. Historically, it's been the college's largest academic major. At the master's level, we offer a graduate certificate in the business of energy, and we offer it to our full-time MBA students or to our professional MBA students. So whether you're uh, devoting a full-time effort to pursuing master's business education and you want to orient that in the context of the energy industry, or you're a working energy professional looking to add additional skill set so you can move forward in your organization and add additional value, you have the opportunity to orient your MBA studies in the direction of energy. But our executive education programs are, are rising as well. I'm a pers personally, I'm an alumnus of our 
uh, Executive Energy Management Program, which is a one-week boot camp for rising energy executives. It's a great overview, particularly if you're coming from a technical background and you want to get a sense for the basics of what the value chain looks like, how strategic decisions are making, how does the C-suite and the world's great energy companies or organizations make decisions. It's a wonderful crash course in, in it preparing you for that type of a leadership advancement. And then most recently, in 2014, we launched the world's most competitive, most impactful executive MBA in energy. And we did it because we wanted to take the charge of having an opportunity to prepare the world's energy leaders wherever we find them. Whether they're right here in Norman, Oklahoma, they're in Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Bangladesh, Shanghai, or anywhere in between. And so we've embraced an innovative and somewhat of a risky way. We've embraced the power of technology to be able to deliver world-class business education, 100% founded in the energy sector, to learners all over the world. It's a beautiful program. About 80% of it is delivered digitally, using the power of technology to connect cohorts wherever we find them, at whatever stage in their career they are, without having to have the physical or professional or personal sacrifice of moving to Norman, Oklahoma to pursue executive level business education. But we never lose sight of the importance of connectivity and the power of a cohort. So they begin and end their, their, their program right here in Norman. And in between, we send them on an international assignment, typically in London. And in between is the, is the digital delivery of what we believe to be the finest executive level education, 100% founded in the energy industry. Every faculty member has energy expertise, every case, every problem set, and yes, every student comes with at least eight and usually up to 13 years of energy sector experience. It's perhaps the finest display of intellectual dynamism and discourse of any of our academic programs. These are amazing students working with amazing faculty, drawn from our own as well as outstanding faculty from all over the world, many of which are leaders in the private sector. But of course, it's not just about academic programs. It's about tackling the biggest issues. It's about generating business insight into those issues to make our organizations, public or private, more effective, more efficient, and more enduring. And that's where the Energy Institute comes in. For over half a decade, our faculty have enjoyed partnerships with great organizations, many private companies, increasingly a forward voice with federal and state agencies. You know, we're gonna hear from the Department of Energy's um, Energy Information Administration. That's been a wonderful collaboration. The series of uh, intellectual partnerships where our faculty, Oklahoma faculty, have worked arm in arm with federal leaders to tackle important topics that are truly shaping national and global energy policy. It's an intellectual contribution that can only be found right here at the University of Oklahoma. And then, and then, frankly, conversations like this, again, in a way that only a university, and probably in a way only the University of Oklahoma can pull off, can pull together. Today represents just another important moment in OU's contribution to Oklahoma and the nation's enduring global competitiveness. And our timing is good. You know, we're, we find ourselves in a presidential election year. And regardless of your politics, you know, I believe that citizens across the country are really focused. And right now the conversations are focused on the economy, economic opportunity, unfortunately increasing threats to our national security, and the environment, particularly as it pertains to climate change. Those are the big issues. Yet, our country's energy resource strength, if you think about it, truly underpins the ability for this country to improve and sustain advancement in all of the above. So, so I guess, how can our elected officials, 
how can our aspirant candidates or just the broader citizenry, how can we fully address these key topics unless we have a forward understanding and view toward the importance of energy? How can we progress as a nation without a comprehensive strategy and an enabling policy for that strategy? Many of the political debates in this year's, in this year's conversation, they've, they've been relatively silent on the subject of energy, but not here. The debates here today will be delivered with full voice. Today we will learn and perhaps even pinpoint some common objectives that many, if not most Americans, can truly embrace. Today, we will tackle big questions, such as how might we engender robust and sustainable economic growth, but in a way that allows us to, to, to enjoy low volatility for that growth? How might we enhance our confidence in our foreign relations, in our national security? How might we enhance that confidence through the foundation of a strong energy policy and a view toward energy security. How can we be assured of real, sustainable progress in all areas of environmental concern, all areas? And how might a right-sized, cost-effective, energy resource mix and a focused technological development plan, how can that play a role? How might we view the importance of success in energy, our success in energy, as an opportunity to reinvest those attendant economic benefits in the other national priorities that mean so much? Priorities such as, yes, education, infrastructure, health, poverty, hunger, safety. Now, I know these are big questions. I know the answers to these questions are important. But as I said earlier, Price College and the broader University of Oklahoma, we are in the business of tackling these big issues. Today is a fine example, and I formally welcome you to the fourth annual Energy Symposium focused on the role of energy and policy in shaping what I believe is an aspirant America. Thank you. Thanks, Dean Poland. Can you uh, tell that he has a passion for energy? Um, we're very fortunate to have him. Um, <clears throat> let me mention that <clears throat> after the second uh, panel finishes at 12:15, uh, we will have a quick lunch. It'll be outside, right out here, from 12:30 to 1, and then at 1:15 we'll come back in this room, and Adam Siminski, who is most of you know the administrator of the EIA will be delivering our uh, keynote address. You won't want to miss that. So hang around for lunch and come back after that. And um, I, I know you'll be glad that you did. Um, let's start with the first uh, panel. Let me introduce uh, the moderator of, of the first panel, a good friend of mine, longtime friend of mine, uh, Mike Stice, who is the dean of the Mewburn College of Earth and Energy at OU. Mike's an OU grad, um, and he's been an energy leader um, working in the industry for over 35 years. <clears throat> Mike began his career in Oklahoma, but I can tell you that he has spent a large part of his, part of his career um, overseas in leadership positions. Um, he's probably worked in more countries than anyone else I know in leadership positions. Um, uh, the Far East, the Middle East, um, and other areas. So. Um, he's very well qualified to be a moderator of this first panel. We were fortunate that he came back to Oklahoma several years ago um, and eventually uh, became uh, the CEO of uh, Chesapeake's Midstream Partners, um, and which became Access Midstream and then a year or so ago was merged into Williams. And so uh, at that time, Mike uh, essentially retired for five or six minutes, I think, and then accepted the position of being the dean of uh, the Mewburn uh, College of, of Earth and, and Energy. He earned his chemical engineering degree from OU in 1981, a master's degree in business in 1995 from Stanford, 
uh, an international director's diploma from Sydney University in 1997. Um, he completed his doctorate of education at George Washington University in 2011. Um, so I am trying to think of uh, a degree Mike doesn't have so that I can encourage him to continue his education, uh, but I haven't come up with that yet. So suffice it to say, he is very well qualified to be our first moderator, and we appreciate him today. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Someone's playing a trick. Ah, there we go. There we go. Everybody's entertaining me, huh? That's good. Uh, but anyway, thanks for the introduction, uh, Jay, longer than it, than it deserves. Uh, the truth of the matter is I was a panelist in the first energy symposium, and I think the concept of making me moderator was so that I wouldn't answer any questions. Um, so uh, I, I do want to briefly introduce your panel here today. Uh, the first panel is, is about uh, geopolitical and macroeconomic policy. Um, we are surrounded by greatness here this morning. Um, I'm excited to, about the quality of the panel. I can see why I wasn't invited back to be a panelist. Uh, we've upgraded significantly from the uh, first symposium. Uh, but we are going to have a lively discussion. And, you know, when you think about the global energy industry that we all understand and love, um, there are so many macroeconomic principles that are at work that this first panel is going to help us kind of discuss some of those principles and give us a foundation for how um, the rest of the day will go. So we are going to focus on geopolitical and macroeconomic issues throughout this panel. I want to start on my far left and your far right. And unfortunately, these days I've gotten old where I have to read with my glasses. I will not spend uh, too much time. These guys have got long resumes, uh, more distinguished education than I have. But on my far left, your far right, is David Gompert. He is a distinguished visiting professor at the US Naval Academy and a senior fellow. Uh, at the RAND Corporation. He is clearly an international affairs expert. He's been on the inside. And the inside, I mean, within the administration, advising on energy policy and understanding how these policies need to be put to work uh, across the globe. So we're very lucky. Please hold your applause while I introduce the entire panel, and then we'll welcome them all together. We have one of our own next to David. We have Joshua Landis. Joshua is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies and associate professor at the University of Oklahoma's College of International Studies. We're very fortunate to have him. He truly is a Middle East expert. And I've run across Joshua in the involvement that we had in Syria. And Syria studies is one of his uh, main understandings. And so we're excited to have Joshua here. If the lively conversation we had at dinner last night reoccurs here today, you're going to be entertained, I promise you. And, uh, uh, sitting next to, uh, to Joshua is uh, Divya Reddy. She is the Director of Global Energy and Natural Resources for Eurasia Group. Uh, I'm, I really enjoyed getting to know her last night. She is an energy policy expert. I was fascinated by the, some of the work she's done on political risk and specifically understanding the country, I, uh, the various countries and, and what they bring to the, to the table. But also, I'm interested in exploring today some of her expertise in, in climate change. And, you know, obviously, she brings a lot to the table for today's um, conversation. Next to Divya is Bob Shepard. Uh, Bob joined Soma Oil and Gas in August of 2013. Um, he's a non-executive director of BlackRock Emerging Root Europe Trust and is a director of DTEC Holding BV. That's the largest private energy company in the Ukraine. So we, ob we have somebody who's been there, done that here in Bob, and we're excited to have somebody who's on the ground and can help us understand it. And then finally, sitting next to me is, is uh, Ed Morse. He probably doesn't deserve um, uh, much of an introduction. He's been here before. We're really glad to have him back. Ed um, has been Managing Director and Global Head of Commodities Research for Citi. 
since 2011. And if you're in the industry like I am, when you say city, that says a lot. Um, and he truly is an energy expert in almost every subject that you can imagine. So uh, we're going to be uh, asking him for our, our next uh, investment advice, and hopefully he'll make us all rich today. And uh, um, so I think the format, just so everybody's kind of aware, um, I'd like to give each of our panelists a warm welcome and joining us here today. Thank you. So as I mentioned, we are surrounded by some pretty smart folks up here. And so what I'd like to do in the format is I will give a question to each and pa every panelist, have them comment uh, to a subject. If you'll hold your questions after we've heard from each panelist, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So uh, the process for doing that, we'll have a couple of floating mics. If you'll raise your hand and I can call on you and get a mic to you, uh, that way everybody can hear your question. If we can, I'll repeat the question so that we can make sure everybody uh, who's online uh, can see and understand it. So uh, let's get started. Uh, hopefully we can get mixed up in this thing pretty quickly. And uh, you know, there's a lot going on in, in, uh, in the Middle East and in China. And, and I think probably the best thing for me to do is to, is to just open this up to, to the broader audience. But I'm going to start if, with, um, with uh, David, if it's all right. Um, and I'm going to specifically go around the world. So we're going to start in China. And, and David, if, how would you describe the current U.S.-Chinese relations? How's that? Good. Um, well, that's a topic that almost defies a brief answer, but let me try. Um, to start with the obvious, uh, it is a combination of competition and cooperation. I mean, even those who favor one or the other have to admit that it is a combination of those two and inevitably will be. And you'll hear that from Chinese leaders and thinkers as you will from Americans. So, but that, that's, again, pretty obvious. Less obvious, but I think important, is that that pattern of cooperation and competition varies from the global level to the regional level. Uh, I've been struck by the um, ability of China and the United States to find common ground on a whole variety of global issues. Um, terrorism, countering terrorism, countering the spread of weapons of mass destruction, uh, climate change, um, energy security, whether it's in the Middle East or across the Indian Ocean. So, I mean, they're, they're not identical positions by any means, but they are, I would say, convergent positions. Uh, not so when you look at the region, uh, which is uh, fraught with uh, not only competition, but potential confrontation, crisis, and, and even conflict. And the reason for this, and I should spend a little bit more time on this, uh, because um, because it is um, so problematic, is that the Chinese, now that they are successful and strong, have a different attitude about their position and about our position in the Western Pacific and in East Asia. As long as China was weak, um, it, it welcomed a very strong U.S. position, whether it was to counter um, the Soviet Union or to um, make it unnecessary for Japan to, to rearm. So the Chinese, though they would never say that until the rapprochement between the United States and China, um, welcomed a very strong American presence and even um, alliance relationships in that part of the world. Not so today. Chinese attitude is, look, that was one thing, and that was when we were weak. We're not now. We're successful and we're strong, and if anybody is going to provide um, leadership in this region and be the ultimate arbiter of security in East Asia and the Western Pacific is going to be China, not the United States. doesn't mean that this is an expansionist, aggressive China. It means that it is a China that believes that a regional leadership, um, political scientists would refer to it as hegemony, um, is, is theirs um, uh, precisely because um, China has succeeded and become the most important country in the region and arguably the second most, most important country in the world. So that completely changes the attitude about the U.S. presence and about U.S. Um, military capabilities in the region. 
um, and also about U.S. Uh, alliance relationships and, and indeed new security relationships, not just the traditional alliance relationships. So we have a problem in the region. There's no denying it, and it's a potentially large problem and potentially dangerous problem because there are also points of friction in the region from what happens if the North Korean regime collapses to Taiwan, of course, to conflicting claims in the East China Sea, and perhaps most importantly, the South China Sea, which the Chinese, now that they have recovered their strength, believe is theirs. I mean, it was. It was simply sort of taken away because they were weak. Um, so these Chinese positions and these points of friction within the region uh, all represent um, crises waiting to happen. Um, and yet, uh, to, to go to the question of the American response to this, we simply cannot, and I think this is, there is a, a consensus on this within the United States, certainly within the policy community, we can't afford a policy of simply making nice to China in the region. We have alliance relationships, we have new countries that are not traditional allies that are looking to the United States to balance the rise of China. We have very important, if not vital, interests in the region, the region itself because of its importance of its stability um, given its economic significance, but also, I mean, the South China Sea is what, 40% of world trade passes through the South China Sea. These are international waters and the United States is going to treat them as international waters. Um, including within 12 miles of territories that China has claimed or is creating. So th there is a very significant potential for, for competition. Not, not a potential, I mean there's a reality of competition in the region. Um, no easy way out by any means. And, and just if I could finish on one point, why I think the region is potentially dangerous. I don't think that American or Chinese policymakers are going to get up one morning and say, well, this is a good day to have a war with the other superpower. Um, the problem, however, is that there are going to be crises for the reasons I explained. And it is in the nature of today's military technology, conventional military technology, that a crisis can develop its own logic in which the desire to avoid conflict is displaced by the desire to avoid losing a conflict as if one is going to occur, where you get a, a military logic that displaces a political logic. And so the, I, I would say that any crisis involving China and the United States, let's say in the South China Sea within 12 miles of a disputed territory, has the potential to become an unstable and escalating crisis low probability, but very, very high consequence. And yet, from an American point of view, we're not about to back away from our access to those waters in particular. So it is complicated and problematic, but um, we'll, we'll work energy into it uh, down the road. Okay? Yeah, let's go ahead and stick with the subject of China. And, and, and Ed, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit and jump around. Um, I think we all recognize the globalization of natural gas. And, uh, a lot of the export capacity that's being built uh, for LNG. Um, we look to Japan and Korea as the two largest consumers of LNG, uh, but China is quickly coming up with two new facilities or ten new facilities on the on their coast. Uh, Ed, what do you think we can expect? Excuse me. What do you think we can expect? Uh, what's the impact on global commodities uh, from China? Yeah, there are, there are two kinds of uh, impacts that China has in the world of commodities uh, without first speaking about LNG. But uh, first, if you look on the list of commodities, China is the importer uh, of close to 50% of every bulk commodity, thermal coal, steel, uh, as a manufacturer of met coal in order to make steel, and iron ore. Uh, and if you look at the industrial metals, about 40 to 50% of total trade. So uh, the uh, the impact of one fundamental change in China uh, has been really tremendous in the world of commodities, and it has affected commodity exporters on a, on a kind of global basis. And that is, uh, China got to this position through what you might call frenetic fixed asset investment, building uh, 10 cities of a million people or more 20 straight years. 
uh, and then deciding to stop doing that. So just imagine the diesel intensity, the copper intensity of the wiring in buildings, the glass intensity, the steel intensity of doing that, uh, and having as an impact uh, the record amount of spending on capital spending on finding and developing all of those materials, iron ore in Brazil and in Australia, uh, copper in South America, uh, and so on and so forth, and all of a sudden stopping the rate of increase of imports and the impact that has consequentially on global trade, which has actually shrunk for the last two years and is likely to shrink again this year and the year after that. So uh, it's not been in inconsequential. Um, on the uh, LNG side in, in particular, uh, if we ratchet back to 2011, um, I, I was speaking at an LNG conference, it's a, the biggest LNG conference uh, in the world every year, uh, and uh, the first four speakers uh, all spoke about the annualized 20% rate of growth of gas demand in China and what that will do to uh, the LNG markets, which from the perspective of 2011 looked like they were going to get to be really, really tight. Uh, and then, uh, again, a record amount of spend, believing there would be a market particularly in China and in India, for uh, all of this uh, demand, which led to a record amount of spending in Australia and now in the U.S. to uh, create the supply to meet that demand. And the U.S. Uh, fortunately uh, had the shale revolution uh, taking place, uh, the consequences of which we've seen, but the consequences of which are still unfolding. And to kind of give you uh, uh, one of the basic features of those consequences, um, Appalachia was not a gas producing area of the country a decade ago. Um, in 2011, uh, Appalachia was producing about 4 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas, which is comparable to the total U.S. imports from Canada. Uh, last year ended with Appalachia producing 21.5 BCF a day of natural gas, which if Pennsylvania were an independent country, would be the third largest gas producing country in the world. Um, and uh, as we project forward, pipelines planned over the next three years could raise that production from Pennsylvania uh, from 21 BCF a day to 36 BCF a day. And rocks look like they could sustain over 40 BCF a day for decades. Um, and this is really cheap. Um, and it uh, can be delivered by pipeline to the U.S. Gulf Coast uh, and still make it very competitive. And just looking at the competitiveness of this, um, the, we, we suspect that U.S. natural gas can land in China, in Japan, and in Europe at a profit and under the current forward curves on the pricing mechanisms that uh, dictate prices of natural gas in these countries. Um, how does the U.S. and China fit in in this? China stopped growing its natural gas demand by not just 20% per year, but uh, for the first 10 months of last year, it grew by 2%. And uh, because India, too, didn't uh, rate, have its rate of growth of 20%, but at a much lower level, we have a massive oversupply of natural gas in the world. Um, I suspect there's a lot of geopolitics in why Chinese gas demand stopped growing at 20% and went down to 2%. I think it has to do with kind of the, the main problem of China and the world economy. It's neither a market economy nor a, a top-down economy. It's something of the two. When it comes to pricing, it's top-down very much. Government decides on prices. Sometimes it liberalizes them. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the Chinese uh, government thought they were really smart in figuring out a natural gas price which was going to be kind of halfway between what the global price was of landed LNG in uh, Japan and Korea uh, and what Gazprom, the Russian gas monopoly, was buying, uh, paying for natural gas by pipeline from the former Soviet Union, Gazprom's old turf, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, which was about $1.30 per million BTU rather than the 18 million BTUs from uh, into the Japanese and Korean markets, and they decided that $10, more or less, was the right border price. Um, and that was a really dreadful decision. 
uh, and they did steal Central Asian supply from Russia. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, the global gas market has become unhinged, partly because of this currently existing and, and future existing overhang of supply from Australia and the United States. So the Chinese have been uh, radically changing the rules by which they're playing in natural gas. Uh, they freed up a whole bunch of independent power companies on the coastal areas to import and negotiate on their own by spot, by a spot-related basis. Um, and I suspect uh, we will see a return to double-digit demand growth for natural gas in China starting maybe this year. It's already, I said 2% last year. It's been 8% year to date uh, in terms of a rate of growth. And uh, when gas is really cheap uh, it's uh, and you are uh, fighting coal pollution in terms of coal ash uh, and metallic content of coal going into the envir environment, not to speak of the carbon footprint, um, they can really make a radical change in that. They're already, and I'll just end here, they're already, if we look at data, and this is kind of thanks in many ways to uh, what Harold Hamm has sort of single-handedly been able to do in forging an agreement within Congress and the ban on exports. Uh, if we look at where U.S. exports have gone since the beginning of the year, recognizing that that ban was lifted uh, only at the end of last year, uh, China's been one of the places that U.S. oil has been delivered, uh, as has Japan, as has France, as has Israel, uh, as has Switzerland. Um, and the natural gas side is just open to that, and it can be landed in Japan or in Korea or in the two biggest growth markets, China and India. Thank you, Ed. So I think it's fair to say these are exciting times. I started with China because uh, they are the big kahuna in the demand side of the equation. I think the numbers that Ed shared with you would indicate that uh, China is going to be a major player as all the commodities are globalized. Um, switching gears, though, I think it's important to recognize that uh, the Middle East is still and will for some time continue to be a material part of the energy portfolio. And so I want to ask uh, Professor Landis to give us a quick update as to as what you see as the most important events that are happening in the Middle East today. Well, I guess one starts with world output of, of oil, which is 96 million barrels a day. That's the consumption of the world. Saudi Arabia is putting out about 10 million barrels of those. Russia, 10 and a half. America now nine-ish. They're the big players. OPEC used to be 60% of world production. Today, it's 30%. So OPEC is playing a much smaller role. And of course, America and, and shale, as we're talking about, has revolutionized this. And the, the increase in production in America from five to close to 10 million barrels a day of oil has revolutionized. Now, Iran is also coming back on. Iran is the one country that has not agreed to abide by the January freeze production level. <coughs> they promised to put out another million barrels a day over the coming year. Iraq has gone up to about four and a half million barrels. At the time we invaded Iraq in 2003, it was about two million. It fell to one and a half million barrels a day that they were producing. Now they're up at four, four and a half. And they want to expand their share of the market too. So there's a lot of pressure, of course, of oversupply right now. On the other hand, the world consumes about 1.8 million barrels a day. I mean, 1.8 barrels, uh, uh, barrels a day increase every year. Last year, we added, the demand went up about 1.8 million barrels a day. Um, this year, it will be less, per, probably, because of lower economic growth. But the world demand is increasing. In 20, 25 years, the number of cars on the roads of the world are supposed to double. So demand isn't going to stay the same. So the overhang that we see today, and even the ability to increase production, is eventually going to level off. On the other hand, as all of our Oklahoma and oil people tell us, $50 is the new $100 in a sense, $50 a barrel. Oklahomans and our shale can produce at 40, 
to 50, they can switch, turn on the switch again. So Saudi Arabia is never going to be able to get $100 a barrel oil again. And that is going to shake up Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. The break-even point in Saudi Arabia for their budget that exists today is $95 a barrel. They need to get $95 a barrel of gas in order of oil to, in order to maintain their present budget. Iran is 70, and most of the Emirates are in a lower, around 70, 60, so forth. Oman is much higher, 92. So there's going to be extraordinary belt tightening in the Gulf eventually. Of course, they have a lot of credit. They can borrow for a long time. This presents the United States with a real dilemma because we depend on the Gulf. Our relationship with the Gulf has been crucial. If we allow Saudi Arabia to crumble and to go into civil war, which could happen, because it's engaged in a war in Yemen, a country of 24 million people, 40% Shiites. They're not going to be able to end that war soon. They're engaged in a war in Syria, which is ongoing. So trying to rein in their budget, given their recent global ambitions, is going to be very hard for them. It's going to be very hard for the Gulf. And that, in a sense, presents the United States with a real dilemma, because our leverage as a world power and to confront China in the South Sea to a certain degree is dependent on our having our hand on the spigot, which is Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. We defeated Hitler in a sense because we denied him oil. The hinge of fate, as Churchill called it, El Alamein and Stalingrad was about Germany getting oil. The U.S. stopped them, and the, the Allies stopped Germany from doing that. And after that, World War II, the United States has tried to lock up, as we call it, hegemony in the Persian Gulf. And a lot of our anti-Iranian policy has been about maintaining that hegemony. Iran has wanted us out and preserving, in a sense, our alliance with Saudi Arabia. We built Central Command after the Iranian Re Revolution in 79 and rapid strike forces, and, and much of our military structure is about defending the Persian Gulf. Now, China would hesitate to do anything radical in the South Sea or to take Taiwan or do something like that because we do have our hand on the spigot. Many Americans say, well, why do we want Saudi Arabia in the Gulf? These are dysfunctional countries that are producing Wahhabi, fundamentalist ideology that we don't like. Let them sink or swim in this new environment of lower prices. But in a sense, we're wedded to these very dysfunctional countries because for stability, for strategic stability, for being a great power. If we retreated from Saudi Arabia, China would be the natural country to replace the US in the Persian Gulf. Of course, China only has one aircraft carrier today, but they're building a lot more. And 20% of their energy, imported energy, comes from Iran, another big percentage from Saudi Arabia. They're the natural people, and India, to try to replace the United States. And that depends on identity of America. Does America willing to retreat from its role as a superpower in the world? And that's something that's very hard. We watched our presidential campaign today, uh, recently, and every leader steps up and says America is the greatest country in the world. We're going to make America great. Americans want to be the policemen of the world. They don't want to because they spent way too much money. And we've squandered trillions of dollars doing that, and they're mad. And Trump says, we're not going to do that anymore. But at the same time, he says, we're going to make America powerful. There's a contradiction, I think, in the identity. And a lot of that has to do with our relationship with Saudi Arabia and, um, and the price of oil. Thank you.
Thanks, Josh. I, I guess, Divi, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to you and talk to us in general about uh, the comments that, that Josh had just made about political risk in Eurasia, uh, I mean, this emphasis on concerns around Saudi Arabia and China. Uh, from your perspective, where, where does the greatest political risk, risk lie from an energy perspective? Yeah, I mean, can you hear me? Um, from a political risk perspective, I mean, we still view the Middle East as um, probably, especially with the abundance of oil being produced in the U.S., um, less emphasis uh, for the U.S. on policing the world um, and less willingness of other players, including China, to, to fill in that gap, that you are looking at a little bit of a, of a lack of sort of leadership um, in terms of solving some of the big geopolitical crises. And in that context, the, the Middle East is, um, is heading to a more unstable um, position, in part because of the rise of Iran, the removal of sanctions, the emergence of Iran as a bigger um, both political and economic player in the region creates more threats probably for Saudi Arabia um, and makes them uh, more likely to, to double down and create more sort of proxy wars as we're seeing already in Yemen. Um, and we're potentially likely to see in other areas. So, um, you know, in our view, that, that still remains uh, uh, the more risky part of the world. Um, there's, of course, also Russia, and we've seen a more um, interventionist Russia um, in Ukraine. Um, but we're seeing a little bit of a thawing of, of the Russian position um, and a, you know, the, their actions in Syria more recently. Um, it, it seems like they are pushing for, for removal of sanctions and therefore um, more willingness to, to play nice, um, at, at least on the margins. Um, so, so in our view, probably um, uh, the, the Middle East is, is the biggest geopolitical risk. Now, for oil markets, it's largely been shrugged off because in the near term, there's not really any material risk to a disruption that would actually um, take a lot of supply off the market that might actually stimulate a price recovery. Um, but potentially over the longer term, as, as some of the U.S. production comes off and um, you have a need for replacement barrels, um, the market starts to tighten up, then some of that geopolitical risk centered on the Middle East might come back into the market. Well, well done. I guess uh, there's a, Bob, uh, you're, you're one of our panelists that are actually actually operating in some of these places and trying to make some things happen. What are your thoughts on, on the risk factors and, and, and the impact uh, of, of the global energy industry and, and specifically what you find to be attractive uh, out there in, in, in the globe? Well, I think um, one of the areas we haven't touched on is Russia, so maybe we'll start there. Um, as indicated, Russia is producing about 10,800,000 barrels today, which is pretty much the peak after the Soviet peaks. Uh, so you, despite low prices, they've been able to sustain that. And again, as most of you understand, the industry inside of Russia is a quasi-industry. There are private companies, public companies, but the major companies are controlled by the state. Rosneft is the largest producing country, company in the world, 3.8 million barrels a day and just majority ownership is, is the, the state. Um, the ruble, I think, Ed, this morning is 70 to the dollar, was 25 three years ago. So there's been a substantial devaluation of the ruble, which has helped the internal producers in a way that most of their costs are in rubles, so they've been able to do that. Then they export a product that's been paid for in dollars. Um, that works for a while. And frankly, internally in Russia, the West, part of Siberia, there is substantial additional work the Russians can do there, providing just conventional good oil field practices, not requiring technologies that were going to be required for the development of the Arctic, for example. Uh, so they have some room to run there, and those fields will operate. They will continue to produce those, and that will help undercut the decline that they're going to see in that 10 million eight. They just, they're not going to be able to sustain it but they can mitigate some of the decline with activities there. The more problematic area for the Russians is the eastern Siberia. It's relatively undeveloped. It's also the area that they've made substantial commitments to the Chinese on and have gotten substantial amounts of money to develop the eastern part. And those are complex reservoirs. They're very difficult to uh, develop. Uh, Western Siberia, the, the, the mother load of the Soviet oil and gas industry, 
is very analogous, and I very much apologize for this here in Oklahoma, but it's West Texas. You've got flattened cake, stratified reservoirs where good oil field secondary recovery practices uh, have yielded substantial results. The eastern part is different, and we're talking about retrograde condensate reservoirs and a lot more complex technologies. So I think they're going to struggle to sustain production or grow production in that area, which is a problem on a macro basis, also a problem with the Chinese, because they have made substantial commitments to the Chinese for that production. Um, the economy shrank last year. It's probably going to shrink again this year. Um, people say, that is that a reflection of the sanctions or is that a reflection of oil price? I think the largest impact is oil price. 50% of the revenues of the country come from uh, export of hydrocarbons. Um, so yes, the oil price has hurt and it will continue to hurt. Sanctions have diminished their ability to go to the international markets for financing, but they've found alternative ways, China and other ways, to try to offset that. Um, a thing that's probably, and Ed mentioned it earlier, which is interesting, and it's a dynamic you don't hear talked about. They talk about oil, but Gazprom at one point was doing 35% of the gas into Europe, and they're no longer doing that. And Ukraine was a transit country for that. Uh, gas, and before the invasion, that was a big issue because they cut the valve off, and eventually the Europeans twigged to the fact that maybe Gazprom isn't the most reliable supplier of gas in the world, and we ought to think about some alternatives. Um, something many of us have been talking to them about for years because we felt like if they could build more regas facilities uh, around Europe, that the LNG market, even back then, you could see the LNG market becoming more and more uh, profitable or more and more available to them. Supply was going to grow, and that was even before the U.S. Uh, uh, bump. So what you've seen is a diminishing, and it will continue to diminish fairly dramatically, um, demand for Russian gas in Europe. So they're sitting there with expansion plans in the north. They have tried to build two LNG facilities uh, on the Arctic. They can't get funding for it. it the economics of it do not work. When you're faced with gas coming out of the Gulf Coast, it's a little difficult to see how you're going to make, uh, make that hunt. So those are the dynamics right now we see in Russia and the industry. Um, and how that energy policy ties into their foreign policy, they are inexplicably connected. So I think you'll see them being more um, looking at an aggressive posture they are making nice in Syria. I think that's more a reflection of the fact that they, they were successful. They went in, did a military operation, got to check out their military hardware, uh, were able to assay one of their allies that, yes, were there for you, and they left before it became a quagmire. So I think uh, from the political side, they saw that as a big success. It also helped them with their discussions with Saudi Arabia about this freeze. So now we've kind of we, we talked a little bit about China. We've talked a little bit about the Middle East and specifically now Russia. Ed, can you make sense of this for us? So when you think about ultimately Russia meeting its commitments to China for natural gas from, I guess it's eastern Siberia, uh, when you think about the new LNG facilities that might cause Russia competition in Europe, when you think about the oversupply or a wash of gas that you described coming from Australia and the United States, um, how does this play out? What, what, what's what's, what's going to happen here? What are, what are the new trade streams that we need to be preparing ourselves for in the future? Sure, there are, there are new trade streams and there are new rules of the game, and I think it's important to focus on them and the, sort of the hidden, hidden hand of geopolitics. And uh, Bob talked about uh, some uh, a little bit. Um, the 2014 was a kind of very critical year. It was a year that uh, finally U.S. oil was exported. Uh, it was to Eastern Canada. That was allowable under the rules of the game. Uh, but it had a critical impact on kind of the Atlantic Basin. Because before 2014, uh, the suppliers to the world, uh, former Soviet Union countries, Middle East countries, could go to all markets, the Atlantic Basin markets and the Pacific Basin markets. Uh, and now all of a sudden, on a permanent basis, the Atlantic Basin 
is not going to be a growth area. It's going to be a very competitive environment in which to, uh, in which to put oil. Um, 2014 was a critical year because it was a year that, uh, because of the events uh, in Ukraine, uh, the European Union and the United States put capital control measures on Russia and Russian companies. Uh, and as indicated, um, Russia had no choice but to go to Chinese capital markets to do this. Uh, and it went to Chinese capital markets to do this at a time when Iraq, Iraq was coming back in the market, uh, as we've just heard a few minutes ago. Iran was about to come back into the market. Um, and the impact of the new credit terms in the form of not we'll lend you money and you'll pay us back uh, the money we've lent you with interest, but you'll pay us back in oil. And that oil stream going into future years could be 20 years worth and a lot of, a lot of oil. It's uh, somewhere between over a million barrels a day and three million a day of p commitments on paper that China has offered not all of which have been taken up. But uh, as a result of those, uh, Russia has effectively gone from supplying less than a half a million barrels a day to China to either directly or indirectly, directly over a million 100,000 barrels a day and indirectly through swap arrangements with Central Asian countries, another 400,000 barrels a day to a China where uh, increases in demand have slowed down tremendously. and. Uh, and that, I think, was really the trigger point for the Saudi change in policy. Uh, also in 2014, and not by accident, we're losing ground, we're losing market share, and we can't really uh, be on an even playing field when China is offering uh, pre-export finance to chunky participants in, uh, in the market. So I think we're seeing new rules of the game uh, that are, uh, are uh, rules of the game of China specific versus what the global rules of the game have emerged uh, into becoming, and it's a not inconsequential challenge to that. It has not been a pr pretty picture for global oil markets or for oil producing countries. If you have Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, which speaks about uh, a freeze, but is actually not ever committed to a freeze. Uh, and I don't think there's really anybody who's committed to a freeze. It's been on the table, it's been talked about, it's helped increase prices, but uh, uh, it has a, a not very pleasant uh, future for, for, for it if you look at it from the perspective of chunky oil uh, producing countries or petrostates that are fundamentally dependent on oil and gas revenue in order to meet their budgetary requirements. It's coming at an even more inconvenient time uh, for Russia in a way in that uh, Iran's return to the market is probably an a inconvenient competitive issue for other Middle Eastern exporters. It's a dramatic problem for Russia in the following way. Uh, the primary target of Iran in global markets is Europe. And its primary target is Europe because it's got uh, 900,000 barrels a day of contracts that used to exist with European refiners. Uh, their, their Asian sales were, were not reduced, they were frozen essentially. Uh, but they lost the European market. They want a handful of European companies, specifically big refiners in Europe, to come back into Iran on the upstream side. Those companies are very eager to show goodwill on their upstream negotiations and have uh, to a, uh, almost every one of them uh, renegotiated the pre-existing, pre-2012 contracts. Uh, so we're seeing a surge of exports from Iran into Europe. Uh, Saudi Arabia has looked at the European market as also vulnerable, uh, and it has uh, increased its storage capacity in Northwest Europe. It is uh, selling crude into Poland, into Finland, into Sweden, and intriguingly enough, into uh, Eastern Germany through injections of crude from Poland into the Russian-dominated Druzhba pipeline. So it's the Russian sales that are, that are vulnerable because they're mostly spot, they're not under contract. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the Saudis understand that that, uh, that that is a kind of big conflict uh, between them. So for countries that, as we've heard, have uh, fiscal regimes in place that require uh, $90 or $100 oil in a world unlikely to see that uh, unless something happens, 
the East China trade relationships are kind of pivotal and uh, of significant consequence. I w I'll, I'll end my comments with one thing, uh, and it is a reminder that the risk that Divya throwed, throwed out at us as a future risk of disruption may not be that much of a future risk. It may be a kind of present risk because in a relatively low price environment, uh, petrostates have a underbelly that's particularly weak, uh, a lot of domestic discontent. Uh, we saw prices rise significantly from January into March. WTI went from $26 to $40 a barrel uh, on a percentage basis. That's pretty, pretty neat. Um, why did that happen? It happened essentially because a bunch of small disruptions to supply under the radar actually were consequential. We had a pipeline explosion out of Turkey that interrupted 630,000 barrels a day of Iraqi supply going into the Mediterranean, priced off of Brent. There was an explosion on a pipeline in Nigeria that uh, took somewhere between 250 and 300,000 barrels a day offline that has not yet come back, also priced off of Brent. Uh, we had another explosion on a pipeline in Colombia, far away from the Atlantic Basin market, but uh, it took another 200,000 barrels a day out of the market. There was field maintenance in the Middle East that took close to 400,000 barrels a day out of the market. The uh, IEA uh, two weeks ago reported their prelim preliminary assessment of February was the first big draw in combined crude and products in over a year. Uh, the world had less oil in the market and the price went up 40%. Uh, and this is a world which is a powder keg in terms of where you could look for uh, disruptions to supply. Um, and uh, that too is an interruption of flows. But uh, we ought not to be complacent about thinking that $50 may be a cap because we've already seen the price going from 26 to 40 in a four week period of time just based on very small interruptions to supply. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think, uh, you know, Ed you've, has commented to that on the global landscape of supply demand, and, and I think that's uh, quite relevant. I think I'd like to ask David a question specifically about how our policymakers are thinking about this. Um, I've been entertained somewhat, you know, having worked abroad and then come back to the U.S. and hear a lot of comments about, uh, you know, how come OPEC is doing what they're doing to us. Uh, uh, if you listen to Ed's uh, comments and you see that the oversupply situation was clearly not necessarily driven from the Middle East, um, do our policymakers policy understand that? And if so, what should their role be as this new globalization of, of natural gas uh, takes place? And I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on, on what they actually will do. Well, I, I have not been in the policy establishment for a few years now, so I really don't know what they're thinking. I can imagine. Um, they do think more in uh, geopolitical terms, particularly uh, national security um, decision makers will, will approach this more in uh, geostrategic terms. Um, particularly when you're dealing with the likes of Iran, the Gulf, Russia, and China, uh, all of which present uh, really substantial geostrategic challenges. Um, with, with regard to Iran, I, I just wanted to insert a quick point about Iran and Russia. The Russians have mixed feelings about Iran, uh, this idea that there is some sort of uh, Iranian-Russian alliance, I think, overlooks the fact that the Russians behind the scenes have been really strong supporters of the sanctions on Iran, and not only because of the Iranian nuclear program, but for the reasons Ed outlined, which is they didn't want to see Iran um, producing and exporting gas again. So the Russians have very much wanted it both ways. Um, I would say um, the U.S. policymakers probably viewed the increase in Iranian uh, production um, not as the principal reason to reach a deal with regard to the uranium enrichment program and the sanctions, but probably a, um, a beneficial um, collateral effect, more, more energy on the market. 
which I think most policymakers would say that's a good thing. And as to the effect of that on the energy dependent countries, it sort of depends on the country. I don't think it's breaking anybody's heart that the Russians are struggling because of low energy supplies. I mean, should we be concerned about instability in Russia today because of low energy prices? Well, I think the Russians in the first instance should be concerned about instability in Russia today. Um, I'm very interested in what Bob has to say about this, but I, I think conditions in Russia are, if anything, more dire than he suggested in his remarks earlier. I mean, Russia has a foreign policy that has become unhinged from its ability to resource its foreign policy. I mean, in a large this, uh, extent, unhinged from reality. Um, Russia, um, l let's, let's keep in mind that it's not the revenues from energy, it's the margin from energy that has been supplying 50% uh, of the Russian state budget. And the Russian state budget, which has been flush with resources over the last 10 or 15 years, has gone predominantly to military, uh, military uh, buildup, modernization, and now military operations. Um, well, if you remove the margin and, and with the decline in prices, you know, that margin is virtually gone. That's where the state revenues come from. And yet Russia, because of its foreign policy, is locked into about $100 billion a year in defense spending uh, to carry forward on committed military modernization programs, not to mention operations. In, in, uh, in Ukraine, they've subsided, and, and uh, Syria. I think the, the lessening of uh, um, Russian activities in Ukraine um, is to some extent a reflection of uh, resource constraints and, and perhaps Syria as well, though I, I do take Bob's point that they seem to have mission accomplished it in, um, in Syria. Now, just to bring this back to China, if I could, and how, how policymakers might think about this, I have found that there's a lot more chatter in Massachusetts Avenue think tanks about Russian-China strategic relationship than there is in the circles of real power. Uh, this is sort of a fashionable idea that particularly because both are having some difficulties with the United States, Russia in Eastern Europe, China in the Western Pacific, that they have gravitated toward each other and that the, the, the gas deal as well as the oil um, a supply relationship has sort of cemented a strategic relationship. I, I think that's, there's a lot less than meets the eye about that. I, I think, first of all, there's the, the deep enmity uh, between the two nations, very deep. Um, there is the fact that the Chinese, after all, seem to have the upper hand, don't they? I mean, Ed, I'll defer to you too, but uh, they have the upper hand in this. It's not like the Russians having squandered their supply relationship to the Europeans because they were attempting to manipulate that relationship, now turn to China and own, now they can leverage and manipulate that relationship. I think they, ha they have no chance of exploiting that supply relationship with China. If anybody does, it would be the Chinese. And lastly, I think the Chinese diagnosis of Russia would be a lot like mine, which is this is a country that's, has, that's in big trouble. Big, big trouble. And not just because of the sanctions, but because of the economy, which, is, which was extremely imbalanced to begin with, and now has been absolutely shocked by, uh, by lower energy prices. Last point, if I may, mm -hmm. um, because we touched on it earlier, I do think in this grand context that a growing supply relationship between the United States and China in LNG and in oil uh, could be very beneficial. Uh, not just in the relationship, but in affecting Chinese behavior in that part of the world where Chinese behavior is very problematic, and that's in the Western Pacific. It's not, it's not a relationship that the United States can exploit and manipulate. We, we don't think that way anyway, but it's a relationship that if it develops, it could be an important new factor in Sino-American relations that would very much serve our 
strategic interests, not to mention our economic interests, and I think the Chinese could be convinced that it would serve their interests as well. Well said. Thank you for that. I, I guess I would assert that it is in this country's best interest to see stability in all these different countries and these stress factors that we're highlighting, whether it be Russia specifically not having enough margin uh, to pay the bills or Saudi Arabia struggling to maintain its, its lifestyle. Uh, this is all quite interconnected. So, Bob, maybe you should give some, some comments about how you feel about this Russia-China relationship, and do you concur with, with David's thesis? Yeah, I think in general I do. The, the deal that was struck between the Russians and the Chinese for um, primarily crude oil and some gas from the east was really a great deal for the Chinese and a bad deal for the Russians. I mean, the terms and conditions of that are extraordinary. And I don't believe Russia would have ever agreed to those uh, if they had any other option. Uh, there is not a great deal of trust between the two countries. Uh, historically, uh, they have had a very uneasy alliance, and it hasn't changed. Um, I can give you a long story about trying to sell a large gas field in Russia to the Chinese and how both sides reacted to that. But it's, it's not, I don't think uh, I would disagree with David at all in terms of the fragility of that relationship, and it's predicated on practical terms, and the Chinese have the upper hand. As to David's comments about the economic viability of the Russian Federation, um, he is right. They have some serious structural issues. When they had this ex large budget, military was a big component of it, but even more importantly, domestically, was the infrastructure development. Moscow itself is in pretty good shape, but the rest of the country has fallen apart. You know, uh, distribution systems for electricity, roads, waterworks, all of that needed substantial upgrading. And that was one of the carrots that Putin was using to, again, solidify uh, domestic support for some of his more adventuresome things. Um, don't be confused, though. The Russian public love Vladimir Putin. And the fact that he's in Syria, the fact that he did what he did in the Ukraine and Crimea, has boosted that popularity. He has returned Russia to the front of the stage. They are now a great nation again, etc. So his domestic um, popularity has, is, continues to be quite high. But he recognizes he needs to do something on the ground in the country. Over the period of time when they did have significant revenues, they put, to get, put a rainy day fund together at the insistence of a guy named Kudrin. Um, and they had and they're drawing that down. Now, how fast they're drawing it down is open to some interpretation. Uh, most people who are familiar with that, including Kudrin and Greff, are absolutely alarmed at the rate at which they're drawing that down. So they've either got to do two things. They've either got to figure out a way to reduce the military exposure, which is hard to do because they've made some commitments, or cut back on the domestic spending, or pray for higher oil prices. They're doing all three, but you know you can argue which will be more effective. To be real honest, I mean, there is a blunt view that because of all of the things that we've discussed this morning, that there's likely to be um, an inflection point, and it's gonna cause the prices to jump. And that, there's just so much geopolitical uncertainty out there in significant areas that you're gonna have something happen. And, and, and Ed, point, Ed brought up a great point with these small little incidences, the cumulative effect of that was a huge jump in price. Well, we all know how inelastic this market is. We lose something. You know, uh, look at Libya. It's, what, 400,000 barrels today to Ed? It used to be 1.6. And it's not coming back soon. If you see one more interruption of something like that, you're going to see the spot. And that, I think, is where the Russians are looking. They're saying something like that's going to happen. If the Iranians and the Saudis get into a little spat, that's no bad thing. Uh, there's a component of that in their thinking, but there's also a component in, in the Kudrin Kraft group. How do we cut back in order to weather this storm until that price comes back? The real frustration, huge frustration with Russia that I've had and others who worked there for a long time is reforms. There's fundamental things that need to be done for this country to ever be sustainable uh, economically. And the answer you get is, we can't do it now because we're in a crisis. And when everything's good, why would we do that? Everything's going great. Okay. 
That's well said. Well Thank said. You. Josh, I, I was hoping you could shed some light on something. So we've talked about how important Russia is. We've talked about how important China is. I'm interested in your perspective on those two countries' relationships with the Middle East, and specifically where, uh, how do they play uh, Iran? Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen times like these create strange bedfellows, and I'm curious if you think that there will be uh, an affiliation that comes out of all of this that creates some new bilateral relations that didn't exist before. I think um, they're interested, in a sense, in easing the United States out of the Middle East. I mean, it's a very, it's a torn relationship. Not, not too long ago, I was in China doing a, an oil, energy, Middle East, China confabulation. And the Chinese were, got angry at us at one point because when a, one ex-ambassador was saying, you know, why don't you help us more on the sanctions? We are hurting the bad guys in Iran, in Syria, Sudan, Libya, so forth. We've put sanctions on all these countries, and they're the bad actors in the international community, and you've got to you know, play your role and get with us to hurt the bad people. And the Chinese got furious at us, and they said, this is a conspiracy on the part of the United States to raise oil prices in order to strangle us. We have brought hundreds of millions of Chinese out of destitution into the middle class because we've had cheap oil. We are the good people in the world creating goodness. You are trying to strangle us <coughs> through these sanctions on countries like Sudan, Syria, Iran, Libya. They had a complete, fundamentally different view of what was good and bad in the Middle East. They've just assigned an envoy China has to Syria. China has voted with Russia not to, and the Security Council, consistently on Syria. They don't want the United States mucking in. They think America is stupid and pursuing a bad policy by supporting the Sunni, a Sunni ascendancy in Syria. They don't like what we did in Iraq they're upset with the Libya thing. So both China and Russia share a concept of the Middle East. The Middle East is not prepared for democracy and needs strong men and stability. America believes that terrorism is caused by strong men and tyranny. And the answer is democracy. And we've pursued a policy of regime change throughout the Middle East to try to depose the dictatorial states, starting with Iraq and, of course, going to Libya, Syria, supporting the, the insurgency in Syria, and most recently negotiating out the ruler of Yemen. All of those companies, countries have fallen into deep civil war. Radicalism has spread. And Putin has said, in no uncertain terms, this is stupid. America's unhinged. All of these countries need a firm dictator. They need the Russian solution. They need me. Of course, our national religion is democracy, and we think they all need democracy. And on that, the Chinese and the Russians concur on a basic ideology of strong men are good. And they concur in wanting to ease the United States out China has gone along with us, on the other hand, in imposing sanctions on Iran. They didn't want to. We gave them some breaks on that, and they've continued to be big importers of, of Iranian energy, and they, they're eager to, to get back in there. But they've understood the value of U.S. You know, they've understood that this is U.S. territory, and they haven't wanted to disturb our relationship. But I think increasingly, as they build more aircraft carriers and they assert themselves in the Middle East, we're going to, you know, we will find more friction. And uh, they're beginning to, they're beginning to ex exert power in the Middle East, strategic military power. 
Well said. So I'd like to open it up to questions in the floor. So if you guys wouldn't mind uh, raising your hand and uh, we're going to get some microphones to you so that we can uh, make sure that you get the question. But while you're warming up, I'm going to ask uh, Divya a question. Just given everything we've said here today, so what? What, what does this mean to, to U.S. energy policy? Where's this volatility, this powder keg that Ed describes? Where's that most likely to happen? Um, What's the headlines look like in, in, when one of those volatile moments take place? Just raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, as, as I think has been pointed out before here, I don't think that we're in a position where, though we are in an oversupplied market, that the geopolitical uh, premium or um, headline risk around oil is going away anytime soon. So, you know, we are still in a position uh, geopolitically where U.S. And U.S. foreign policy will in part have to be uh, cognizant of uh, disruption risk to energy markets and uh, protection of sea lanes and other things that have traditionally been the drivers for, for foreign policy. Um, it perhaps removes some of the urgency uh, or anxiety around um, uh, energy security, um, not just for the U.S., but also for China as well. You know, we saw a lot of their uh, energy policy over the past decade or so being fueled by this energy security anxiety that perhaps is less salient now than it was a few years ago. So in terms of, of their own foreign policy, um, you are likely to see it less driven by those fears. Um, and that potentially creates some opportunities for cooperation with the U.S., um, and, you know, potentially even opportunities where, as China continues to undertake overseas um, investments um, on a more selective basis, that there are opportunities even for, for investment in the U.S. So, you know, I think, I think there are risks certainly around competition. There are likely to be more uh, competition for, for market share um, in Europe, but also market share in China um, between some of the, you know, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia. Uh, there are those dynamics that will continue to play out, but I think there, there's potentially more uh, room for cooperation as well that we might see. David, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to make a brief statement because this has gotten all very complicated with all these regions and so on. But I just think that what's happening presents the United States with an extraordinary geopolitical opportunity, not to mention economic opportunity. I mean, just step back. Um, the opportunity to develop a supply relationship with China, which may enable us to cooperate more and confront less. Um, the opportunity to deny uh, both Russia and Iran the ability to exploit a regional uh, natural gas pipeline uh, relationships. That's a good thing. Uh, the fact that Russia is going to have to come to terms with its economic um, difficulties and perhaps uh, spend a lot less on military systems and conduct a foreign policy that is more in line with the actual resources, that's a good thing. Uh, the fact that our allies around the world can look increasingly to us <laughs> as steady, um, reliable uh, suppliers of energy, whether it's Japan or, or the Europeans. I mean. Yes, there are complications because of the depressed price, which has, is good news and bad news for our own country, and as, as well as a lot of these um, other energy producing com uh, countries. But I, I would just urge us not to lose sight of the fact that this new energy situation presents, to me, far more opportunity uh, for the United States across the board. Of all the panelists here to be the an optimist, that would have been the last one I would have predicted. <laughs> Well done. We have a question. Yeah, Chairman C and the uh, the party are not proving to go uh, gently down the slippery slope to representative government, but they know they've got horrible pollution problems. They're scared of the populace rising up. Following up on what you're saying, it does seem only natural that we should be getting a whole lot more LNG into China. So my question is that preface is, do you see a lot more support or uh, pressure for uh, rising natural gas prices than perhaps for oil, which appears to be maybe, maybe it could wander for a lot longer? That was a question.
question was put to me. Okay, well, I'll start, and then maybe Ed wants to chip in. I, I'm not sure about the price aspects, but I got to tell you, policymakers, as they begin to think about it, would see enormous advantages in exporting liquid natural gas, liquefied natural gas to China. Uh, enormous advantages in that it can cushion the relationship, it can add an element, um, an inhibitor in Chinese uh, um, assertiveness in some of these contested areas because they wouldn't want to jeopardize that relationship. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all good. And, and um, here I defer to Ed, but I think there are some things uh, that the government could do to, um, to foster uh, such a supply relationship and to see it grow to levels that have really um, economic significance, but I would also say geopolitical significance. Now, what we cannot do is get in our heads that if we, if we become a supplier of LNG to China, we've got some sort of leverage that we can use against the Chinese. But, I mean, they're, they're not going to go for that, obviously. Um, but, but I do think that if you talk, think about these crises that I mentioned earlier, where it's really important to avoid crises when we can, and yet the United States is not going to back off on some of these issues. So it's going to be up to the Chinese to avoid a crisis. If you add an energy relationship to all the other things that connect us, I think that can be a real inhibitor, not because we're manipulating it, but because the Chinese know that that's just more loss <laughs> for China and its future in the event of a crisis, let alone a conflict with the United States. Others? You want to address the price? I, yeah, I'd also like to address something that, you know, it really does exist. It's not a popular subject in this part of the United States because it has to do with COP21. But uh, in fact, the United States and China, the two largest polluting countries in the world, uh, decided that the direction of environmental policy and governance globally was a big, big misstep that uh, had been uh, kind of done by an alliance between Japan and the countries of the European Union. And they decided to change the rules of the game of the governance system in uh, environmental issues and uh, started a process of show and tell around the world and got a bunch of island countries and the rest of the world to kind of gang up against Japan and Europe and just kind of dramatically transformed the global dialogue on the governance of environmental control. And it was, it was actually that bilateral relationship that discussed it openly on how do we do this and they, and they implemented it and it was incredibly successful uh, and may in, in the end result in a lower level of of carbon emissions than the path that was being pursued by kind of the European uh, framework that had existed. Um, on natural gas, and particularly to your point, David, uh, we have a real problem, and that is uh, for national security concerns, when CNUC bought Nexen, and Nexen had uh, deep water properties in the United States, uh, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of conditions placed on Chinese direct investment in the U.S. Uh, and uh, the Chinese have been particularly acutely attuned to the degree to which U.S. leverage over uh, other countries in the implementation of sanctions was based on their direct investment in the U.S. So I, I don't think that uh, building on the fact that there's a tremendous amount of world trade involved in the bilateral trade relationship, I think unless unless there is an investment opportunity for large-scale Chinese investment in what would be perceived as a U.S. resource base. I doubt that there would be a significant encouragement of the trade relationship, except at the margin. And the margin is useful because it's more competitive for the rest of the world's LNG system to have U.S. highly competitive LNG being imported into China, uh, particularly because the one, the one, the one dramatic aspect of uh, U.S. LNG exports, Australian is a little bit like it, but not quite the same, is that the U.S. is the only major uh, LNG exporting country, it's not one yet, but it will be pretty soon, that has no destination restriction allowance in a contract. 
So uh, that means you can buy it and resell it anywhere in the world, which gives it great flexibility. It also means that eventually, like in the next two years, a global spot market is going to emerge, and Henry Hub is going to be the price setter, not the LK, the JK marker in uh, in, in Asia. Um, but on on US LNG, the price, you know, I, I think it's un, unwise to think about uh, gas either either being more advanced than oil as a price leader or even following it uh, in the price mechanism. Just If you just look at where the gas is and how cheap it is. So I talked about Pennsylvania earlier. British Columbia is like Pennsylvania. And from a resource-based perspective, it's just as cheap to develop and it's just as abundant and it provides you know, more than five decades of supply to a, to a market that uh, you can bring into the market uh, new supply cheaper than any place in the world, cheaper than the Amal Peninsula, the only the only other place in the world that could rival North American gas from a feedstock perspective is uh, is Northfield or South Pars. Uh, so from a global competitive perspective, I wouldn't think that uh, U.S. or North American gas prices are going to go up. And since there's oversupply that's likely to persist for a considerable time in the world market, that actually has a feedback mechanism into North America because it means that U.S. gas can't be sold in the global marketplace at a higher than X price. That's NVP prices in the U.K. and uh, JKM prices in Asia. Uh, and, uh, and that means that whatever happens in terms of incremental demand, which is enormous, whether for petrochemical plants, whether for transportation fuels, which will go up again once the relationship between oil and gas flies apart to the higher ratio that it was at a couple of years ago, um, it, there's just a, a lid. And the, the question is, where is that lid? It's, it's clearly sub $5. And I think it's clearly sub $4. So where between three and four is the, is the equilibrium price going to be in the US? So Divya, a couple of things I'd like you to address. First, the pricing scenario that, uh, but I, it's come up a couple of times around uh, pollution and climate change. What are the impacts that's going to have on the global commodities that we're talking about here today? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do agree with Ed that I think the, the agreement between the U.S. and China signed um, last year and then um, sort of solidified in the, in the climate change agreement in Paris last year does set the trajectory toward um, increased focus on policymaking of um, sort of diversification and um, a switch away from a heavy dependence on fossil fuels. And in that context, natural gas obviously benefits as being a cleaner source for power generation. Um, but I will say, in the in the kind of short term, there have been, you know, undoubtedly China's longer term trajectory for natural gas demand is very strong. There have been some shorter term setbacks that have, um, you know, on that trajectory. Among them is the economic slowdown, but also the um, the lack of competitiveness still with coal in the power sector, and um, on the on the industrial side fact that crude prices have fallen so much um, and, and the controlled pricing for natural gas that they've had has meant that they that um, in the industrial side you haven't seen as much pickup on natural gas um, and a lot of people are still using oil products. So um, given that those setbacks, it does appear that at least for the next five years, China's a little overbought on gas in terms of their existing um, contracted supply of LNG, a lot of it from Australia um, as well as Qatar. Um, and pipeline gas from Central Asia, as well as their domestic production as well. So the, the sort of near-term demand surge for additional LNG from the U.S. might be a little limited, but longer term, I think, I think it's sort of a time frame question where longer term it's probably stronger than it is in the next five years. Yeah, I think so, I think so. Yeah. We had a question over here. Um, I'd like to address this probably to Professor Landis and maybe to Mr. Morse and Mr. Shepard. Um, and really, it's a two-part question. I'd like to read a statement and ask you first if you agree or disagree with this statement. And, and if you agree with the statement, do you think that this is a good thing for the American industry, energy industry, or not? And, and here's the statement. When we test the logic of the Saudi strategy in keeping OPEC's output high, we can see it makes perfect sense, but only in the service of a long-term objective to destroy supply capacity, particularly midstream and upstream, and fundamentally tighten or reset the global market. 
one can easily imagine prices doubling, as we've discussed here this morning, between $50 and $60 a barrel if OPEC signaled that it, would, it is going to resume its role of balancing the market rather than resetting it long term. Thus, by simply producing 90% the volume, in other words, 10% less than they are now, but selling the oil for $50 to $60 per barrel, OPEC and particularly Saudi Arabia could expect to earn 180% of their current oil revenue. So long term, do you agree with that statement of, as to whether or not that's happening now and that's the purpose? And if you do, is that a good thing for the United States energy uh, market, uh, energy industry or not? Saudi Arabia faced a dilemma. They, they thought, I think some believed that they could do what they did in the 80s. When, when prices went up, of course, to 73, but then there was the Iranian revolution went up to $40 and then came down to six and, and crushed America for about 15 years with a savings and loan crisis. It took us a long time to get back. Now that's a very different situation. If, if Saudi Arabia, shrunk its production. America would reach up and produce more. Our capacity, that, that, that's the trouble with shale, is the capacity to expand is tremendous. And the supply, America would just begin to take more and more share of the international market. So Saudi Arabia, in a sense, has to try to crush American shale. The trouble is, is it's not going to be able to do it because it, the margins have fallen. At, at 40 to $50 a barrel, America can still be profitable. And that's, that's, the, that's the difficulty. So everybody here has talked in this panel to, has talked about the risk factors, price going up, if there is an explosion in the Middle East or a Libya or something like that. But it's not about the inability, if there is stability, to expand supply because of the shale revolution. And that's, that's the dilemma that Saudi Arabia faces. So, you know, is this, you know, ultimately it's very good for America, as we've been hearing from Dave and everybody else, the opportunities are tremendous because America is going to be producing a lot more energy and we're going to be making more money. Um, so that's, I guess that's the, you know, Saudi Arabia and OPEC, which have fallen from 60% of the market to 30%, are facing uh, a very troubled, you know, a very troubled future because they've gotten used to having very high prices and they're not going to be able to do it. So Joshua, just to put words in your mouth a little bit, I think you're saying no to the statement because the implication is that the price would go to 50, 60 if they back down. Your statement is no, more oil would fill that spot. Right. But if that were to happen, it would be a good thing for the U.S. Is that is that your conclusion? The question if, was U.S. industry, not right? The US. U.S. industry, yeah. Right. Well, we would like sixty-dollar barrel oil in the. Sure, US we'd love industry. to. You know, we'd love Saudi Arabia to sort of turn dial it back, I yeah. guess, and let us, you know, take Play more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure, Ed. What are your thoughts on the same question? Well, I'm I'm on the same side as no on uh, on the on the assessment. You know, I think I think Saudis have come pretty close to saying effectively that as a result of what they've seen in the world, partly of which, part of which is on the supply side, part of which is on the demand side, which has to also be addressed. Part of what we've seen in the world tells us that if we produce oil now, it's going to be more valuable than if we hold back and keep it in the ground and produce later because their assessment made in a peak oil theoretical world where they had the cheapest oil in the world um, is no longer one that they fully believe or they half believe and they want to see what happens over time, but meanwhile it's better to produce now than to produce later. Um, I think there's a, an important demand side to the assessment and um, I think the analytical community, the, certainly the oil companies even in this, uh, in this state are at odds with one another on a view to whether we're in a two million barrel a day environment or a less than one million barrel a day environment um, I tend to side with the lower end rather than the higher end. Um, and I think COP21 
pushes further in that direction. And certainly, if you listen to official Saudi statements, they're extremely uh, anxious about whether transportation fuel demand is going to peak at some point in time uh, as a result in part of technology in COP21. If you look at what the Saudis are telling the world, uh, you don't have to look very far. You look at the um, last two annual reports of Aramco and look at their projected oil demand growth through 2040, which is not from a global perspective that far away from now. Uh, and they say the average incremental demand is going to be 0.64% per annum, which is you know, roughly half of what it currently is, which means that we're, in their view, asymptotically moving to zero growth in demand, uh, which also has a, a, an important, uh, is an important factor in the assessment of, of the answer to your question. On whether it's good or bad for the industry or the world, um, I think there is one element of the shale revolution that we've seen in spades and that the world, nor, neither the world nor the industry has come to grips with. And that is uh, by the definition of shale production, by the definition of this being very low cost of entry production to go into with uh, companies that don't need uh, financial support to do risky exploration because we have a financial services sector that provides for all practical purposes an infinite amount of capital to meet whatever the demands of the of the industry may be. The result of that on the production growth side and on the decline side is volatility, unpredictable volatility. Adding to the volatility is a factor that is also very new, namely uh, the fact that you can build a frack log, an inventory of drilled but uncompleted wells that has been growing and growing and growing in this environment. Uh, and we don't know the pace at which it will come back. We don't know the scale by which it will come back. But our estimates are if there were a rush to completion, it would add somewhere between 400,000 barrels a day and a million barrels a day within a year, uh, which is also an element of volatility uh, impacting the price of, of the good in the market. Uh, so is volatility good or bad? Uh, it's bad when exacerbated by financial flows that uh, that tend to exaggerate it. Um, and I don't think I'm ready, at least for an assessment of whether that's good or bad for the world or the US. We have a question here on the aisle. Sure. Th <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, it seems, and, and David, I may sort of direct it to, uh, towards you initially here, but uh, an acknowledgment that the energy renaissance in the US has got geopolitical value to our, our international relationships. But uh, I think we could also acknowledge that there is, uh, you know, the value of this energy is now under threat, at least short term, with the destruction of the U.S. industry that's going on today, the loss of service companies, let alone, you know, uh, oil companies that are going bankrupt and that sort of thing. So I would agree in, in the sense of volatility uh, may be the consequence of this, but is there something we should do in terms of U.S. internal policy that reduces the volatility in a sense, um, you know, levels out the, uh, the, the business models for U.S. oil and gas producers to stay alive. I'm going to answer that question. Hey, because I'm not sure I, I know the answer. Um, it, it seems to me uh, on the economic, on the basis of economic logic, that there is a a tendency for prices, world prices, to move toward uh, right to the edge for American producers uh, because of this sort of spring mechanism between Saudi production and what their expectations are of American production. And I know, Ed, I'm grossly oversimplifying this, but if you think about it, I mean, the Saudis have an incentive, you know, to. to Reduce to the point, um, and you know, allow everybody else in OPEC or elsewhere to pr produce to the point where it brings the price down to put pressure on um, the uh, the U.S. industry and uh, those, and its creditors um, and its job force and everything else. Um, but that's a very low price for the Saudis, of course. So then you get this pressure to push up. Um, 
but of course, as you move away from that point, then, you know, because a good deal of the infrastructure is in there, because you can hire the people back, because you can probably always go, as Ed says, and get the financing, the U.S. industry is going to spring back um, in, in response to that higher price. So this suggests that, yeah, the U.S. is really operating right on the edge. Um, and it, I'm not sure, this is my question, I'm not sure what policies would alter that sort of fundamental economic logic where world pressures would drive the price down to the point where the Americans would be barely competitive, if at all. Now, of course, if you get improved technology for U.S. production, which we're constantly getting, that just pushes that price point down. But I don't know um, what the United States government can do in energy policy or in any other sort of regulatory that would bring about more stability and steady production at a price that makes it profitable, uh, enables them to pay off their debts and so on and so forth. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to put it to the other panelists. Bob, please. Um, well, I think that's a slippery slope when you get the government helping you set price and establishing all of that. I've worked in lots of countries around the world where governments have done that, and what you do is introduce enormous inefficiencies and market distortions that are ultimately make it the most expensive proposition you can have. I think the U.S. government's policies could be to help this industry become as efficient, as flexible, and uh, you know, access to the markets, LNG, exporting of oil, all of those things which are now happening are there. The regulatory environment needs to be streamlined. I mean, there's a whole litany of things the government can do to improve the environment for the competition of the market to take place. It's painful, but ultimately it creates the efficiency. Ultimately it drives the technologies that have led this. This whole thing is spun on a technology that was driven by the fact that how do we get more out of what we've got? The prices are here. We're running out of oil, et cetera. All of those imperatives that's what's created the Shell Revolution. So I think having the government help you do that, I think getting out of the way is to the extent possible is the best thing they could do for the industry. It's painful, but ultimately it's the most efficient. Yeah, I just want to add one other thought to what Bob has said, which is actually on target. What the government needs to do is stay out of it and create certainty rather than insert uncertainty in the environment. And, I, and it just as an observation, uh, all of this means it is in America's interest to be a free trade country. And the problem has been that every single presidential candidate has voiced for one or another part of an extreme of protectionism. And it's that which is probably the, the biggest danger to the industry, even if it's done for well-meaning purposes. Yeah, and I would just comment that the isolationist kind of rhetoric that you hear from time to time is really alarming to uh, not only our industry within the U.S., but uh, the globalization, and completely incongruent with what we advocated uh, when we were in their countries and they were de developing their resources. I'd also make a comment. I'm not a panelist, but you made the comment about failing industry. Uh, um, I agree with Bob's comment. It'll bounce back. Uh, unfortunately, it may require some restructuring because you have balance sheets that were based on a, a price view that didn't come to, to come to pass. And that's going to be a very difficult period of transition. Um, but I'm also very confident in this industry to bounce back and restructure, redo its balance sheet. Uh, the technologies are working, and there's a margin there to be made. And so for that reason, the U.S. energy industry is quite resilient. And that would be my comment to add. I don't know if, if you would agree or disagree with that, Ed. No, I, I agree entirely. There's one other point to make on it, and that is because of a whole bunch of factors, one was the excitement of the industry, in other words, the competitiveness of the U.S. E&P sector and the competitiveness of the financial sector. But we wantonly spent capital to expand at a rate, 2014, having U.S. production rise by a million, 350,000 barrels a day. There was no earthly reason for that to have happened. So maybe more disciplined capital spend will also be a healthier thing for the industry. So if you're looking for the enemy, look in the mirror. Uh, we, uh, we, we are they. Uh, so anyway, thank you all very much. And please uh, join me in thanking this distinguished panel.
quick announcement. Mike, thank you for moderating. No Outstanding problem. job. And to all the panel members, thank you very much. Um, I think you all agree. Very informative, very insightful, and great food for thought.